Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and I am here with my illustrious co-host, I am Matt here. Scott. I am here. And uh, do you, have, you have some exciting news. I got engaged. I know. That's so awesome. I'm planning a honeymoon. I know. It's cool. It is so cool. I'm running away to Africa. <clears throat> that is exactly where a honeymoon yeah. should take place, especially with you and Laura. That's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'll be... It'll be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. It'll be this summer. Oh, it's so, it's so great. Well, I guess kind of fall. September? Yeah. August? August? It'll be, is August summer or is yeah. August fall? Uh, for them, it's... 21st. It's, for September them, it's... 21st, well, yeah. in Africa, it's going to be... Yeah, it's going to be springy. Tanzania. <laughs> yeah. I'm exactly. Get my finest Overland Expo apparel on and look like go. I'm... I don't know... <laughs> 1900s British Explorer. Yeah, exactly. I'll walk around. And actually, drink I think tonics. I actually have photos of you in just such attire. In fact, I think you you became an unwitting cover model for Overland Journal. At one oh, point. I remember <laughs> that. I was forced to wear those horrible clothes. <laughs> you were, you were, and and at like a or like an Enfield rifle and everything like that. I that's exactly what happened. I didn't even know how to hold it. I know. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Oh, those are great memories. That's all. Well, man, congratulations. Says the that's guy who's now wearing a Fieldcraft Survival t-shirt. Pew, pew. Pew, pew. Yay. Well, those, those guys are awesome, too. They're, yeah. they're the real deal. Totally, like totally the I like real Mike. deal. like Mike. Yeah. They're amazing, amazing. Humans. So we're talking so. about the Ineos Grenadier. Yes. Which they had one in the United States recently. Right. Still in prototype stage. Correct. And you flew out somewhere... To the East Coast. I did. I went to Virginia. Oh. And they were just super gracious. So, yeah. I mean, we, we're obviously so enthusiastic about the idea of yeah. this car. When I saw that there was an opportunity for us to get hand, oh, yeah, hands on, sure. I, I, I literally like stalked the Ineos PR team and was able to, <laughs> to, make, to, make it work, to make it work. And they were so gracious and they were so excited to have us there. And, and I think that that is the thing about Ineos that is the most interesting to me and to us as a podcast is the fact that this vehicle and automotive company is born out of yeah. one person's passion for overlanding and Land Rover Defenders. Yeah. So the fact that Sir Jim Rad- let's call Radcliffe. Him, let's call him Jimmy. <laughs> exactly. Jim Bob. <laughs> It's just, I don't know. It just sounds cooler, like Sir Jim Radcliffe, which is awesome. I mean, like yeah. that that in and of itself, right? I mean, this guy has traveled for months around Africa on on adventure motorcycles. He's been to both poles. He's got. I know he has a trip planned for Namibia with one of these vehicles. Ooh, that'll be cool soon, which I think will be a great a great I heart initial. Namibia. T- yeah, totally. Yeah, Namibia is wonderful. Well, we had such a great trip there with the Defender. I want to go back. I know, right? Well, you'll be in Africa. I want to leave. Enough. <laughs> I want out. Let me out right now. Let me out. But if you if you look at this whole idea of of a squillionaire, yes, that owns a literal squillionaire that owns this massive petrochemical, you know, like, hydrogen like, like actually owns it. Yeah, like exactly. Yeah, he write, he signs like, the checks. Like privately owned. Like yeah. I know a lot of people think like Tim Cook is like the richest guy in the world. No. Tim yeah. Cook's an employee. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Whereas This is where the money's at, guys. Whereas Sir Radcliffe, right? He he can just decide one morning that I'd like to be able to continue to buy defenders. Land Rover says no. And when you're a squillionaire, you just you just like pull an Elon Musk and say, yeah. Okay, no problem. I'm gonna build my own. That's the same thing that happened. With Elon Musk, he went to the Russians to get decommissioned ICBMs to launch stuff into space, and they said, "Ha ha, no, go away." And he's and then, so then he just made his own. Made his own. He yeah. brushed up on some space stuff and started his own company. And I mean, that he, guy, of course, developing is, a car is probably like me putting shocks on my truck. Exactly. Yeah. Probably the same amount of yeah. Money being <laughs> the Delta. There. Yeah, yeah, the Delta. So when you look at the outcome of that, it's clearly someone that is very well traveled, has done a lot of remote travel by yeah. vehicle, and has a love for Land Rovers. Because if you if you look at the profile of this thing, it's it looks very reminiscent of a Defender. In fact, it probably even more so than reminiscent. Yeah. And I think that there was there's a couple stylistic cues that if they had been left out would it have made it look less reminiscent? Like 
the grab handles that are in the place of the Alpine windows. Mm. If some of that stuff have, had been left out, which I see the functional benefit, if it had been left out, it would have looked a little bit more its own machine. Yeah. Um, but if you if you think about a G wagon or a seventy series or a one ten, they're all kind of the same box. Yeah, it, it, to me, it looks like the Santana version of a Defender. You right. know, like it. You're like, is that a Defender? No, but yes, <laughs> so close. Yeah, it's so and, close. And it was interesting what you were saying that it looks. You know, you, since it's been compared to the Defender and and that whole history of him wanting to purchase the tooling from Land Rover and Land Rover saying no, um, probably they didn't want to admit how horrible their tooling was yeah but uh that was kind of mean i'm sorry land yeah. rover I mean, it's a beautiful car but like let's just be honest well, it's 50 year old tooling yeah, right it's old tooling and and like the panel gaps of 1980s british cars like yeah yeah okay let's move on um but you said it you know it's a bit larger and then it when is you put into my mind everything i hate about the defender you know the original defender is it's too small yeah like like for I mean, I'm not like a huge dude. Yeah. But I'm You're what, 6'2", 6'3"? 6'2", 6'3". Yeah. But like the, you know, the the B pillar is like somewhere in my collarbone. <laughs> totally. So, you know, like you, you develop this like awkward, like I'm going to drive like this. Or wait, nope, nope, nope. I got to move my torso this way because the pedals actually are different than that. <laughs> totally. Um, so I'm all for it. Yeah. It sounds great. And the funny thing is... It, and this was my experience is you look at the vehicle and you and I know the size of a defender. So I just kind of expected it to be the size of a defender yeah. and it is not like it's, that's one of the things that I can share on this podcast. Having seen it now in person is it's actually bigger than a G wagon and the front doors are very full size. I mean, this is a mid sized SUV and the front doors have tons of space. They're much longer than a Defender. Yeah. And then the rear doors are longer than both a Defender and a G-Wagon. These, It's probably a 116-ish inch wheelbase. They, they don't have that spec finalized, but yeah. it looks like around that kind of wheelbase. And then it would easily take a third row or even cool. like troop carrier style seats behind the second row. So it's a it's a big vehicle. I sat in it. They gave us the opportunity to sit inside it, which it was a it was literally prototype 001. So it's just all diagnostic equipment and stuff. Yeah. There's no finished interior, so it's there's you can't really draw much from it other than that sense of space on the inside and it's big. Mm. It's a really comfortable size vehicle, but it's also not the size of a Yukon or a or yeah, a Ford Bronco or it's 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 you know, it's probably going to be the size of the new Ford Bronco. Okay. I would say. That's cool. Yeah. The other thing that surprised me was, and is very non-Defender-ish, if you look underneath this thing, it is like take a G-Wagon, which you and I have both owned and driven yeah. extensively, and then make it with the same... Add dirt. more beef. Yeah. Make it like an F-350 underneath. I mean, the control arms and the axles and the prop shafts yeah. and the size of the transfer case... And the knuckles and the CV axles and all, it just, they are massive underneath oh, this thing. I'm about that. Yeah. I mean, more beef, more better. <laughs> yeah. I mean. And it's weight down low too, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's not in a bad well, spot. Well, I mean, I, I know that their thing is, is really the NGOs, mm -hmm. you know, aid organizations, that, that sort of thing, developing countries, developing worlds. Um, that, you know, and I think that's an interesting strategy to get production going, because if you, if you went and said, oh, I want to have this in Europe, yeah, you know, there, it seems like there's always moving goalposts as far as internal combustion vehicles and safety standards and stuff. They're like, you know, it's difficult, you know, Europe, it's Europe and then America, our emission stuff is really, really, you know, challenging particularly for diesel so right. you know get get the production going and go to africa go to go to asia go to the places that you know because the 70 series is in the 70s got to be gone soon right like i would i would sure think so but it's still it it it's the last option standing yeah. so the g-wagon is gone the 461 it, other than some very austere uh contracts that are being finalized and then the defender's gone you know, the J8 
never really took off. So it's the, the defenders still here. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. Um. So yeah, that's that's interesting to me because like I I have to say that if if it's price competitive, I mean, let's be honest. If they're going after the developing world, they're competing with the Toyota Land Cruiser. Mm-hmm. Um, anything else is going to be, you know, some Chinese pickup truck or something. Yep. If it's more modern, more durable, more powerful, why why wouldn't you want that? Yeah. I mean, I, I know we all get very nostalgic and romantic for the 70s, but, like, as a 2021 20, vehicle, they frankly suck. Yeah, it's their, their design standards are, they're just not consistent with, what's been yeah, what's like, been accomplished in the last couple of decades the with the grenadier you're looking at a vehicle that has been designed by Steyr Push yeah, within the yeah, last the engineering partner within the last few years to be the ultimate representation of this kind of vehicle so the it's going to be who brought you the Pinsgauer yeah and the G-Wagon and the Halflinger yeah the Halflinger yeah exactly that's true let's hope <laughs> hopefully this sells better than the Halflinger <laughs> Um, yeah. And it's going to be made in France. I know there's a little bit of hubbub with it was supposed to be made in Wales. Yeah. And then they did the Brexit. Yes. I mean, at least that's what I'm going to attribute it to. It has to be a big influence to that. I mean, if you just, as a business, to start off yeah. under duress. There's only ha- one reason that you would willingly decide to make a car in France. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. I wonder if they're really good at it that now i wonder if they've become like the detroit of europe maybe i don't know every time i go there they're on strike for something like (laughs) that's true i've tried to go to the top of the eiffel tower twice and they're striking yeah that's so true well sorry french people well you i mean they're french you know the thing with french people people is that i'm actually just jealous because they have the best like work life balance of anywhere and that's what they say Like, like i get i want it to be acceptable in america for me to just like open a bottle of wine a bottle of rosé at one o'clock yeah smoke a cigarette and read some kind of artsy novel like that sounds great but i get like a big mac and instagram here so i'll take that back france yeah yeah, yeah, they've got it figured out got it figured we think we've got it figured out that we totally don't the french French do (laughs) yeah but wow that was a little bit of a tangent it was a good tangent though it's 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 the same thing about this vehicle it's like maintaining perspective on the fact that People are going to hate on this car in some way, which is just only their own petulance in my mind. Yeah. Like, it's just like, it would be like hating on the French for only working 35 hours a week and drinking rosé. and Because we're yeah. jealous. Yeah. I mean, just, let's be that's, honest. That's the thing is it like, this car is really neat and it's going to do very, a very good job for five link are. front. Yeah. Five link front and rear and... Yeah, the, and the links were massive, mm. and it's going to have three di- three differential locks, just like the G wagon. So it'll have two engines. So it'll BMW derived. Yes, gasoline petrol engine. Yep, and then diesel, right? There's diesel for rest of the world and not for gonna Europe. Come to the U.S. At, as of this point, it does not appear that that's going to be the case. And that's e- an easy thing for people to hang a hat on, I think, is like, oh, it's not going to come with the diesel. It's actually not as great as I thought. Yeah, it's a really good excuse for those who are never going to buy it to have a reason that they weren't. Yeah, that's true. You know, oh, it's not in a diesel. Yeah. <laughs> but, the, you know, a modern gasoline with an eight-speed is just, these are great engine. They're, it's yeah. a straight six. I mean, we all, we all loved our our TJs with yeah. straight sixes and that four liter, like nobody ever hated on those motors. Those were great motors. And now we've got a modern equivalent of that built by BMW to be a high performance, very fuel efficient gasoline motor with an eight speed automatic. I think it's going to be a, a wonderful pair. I love the eight speed. They chose the ZF eight HP. That yeah. thing is in everything from a BMW one series to a Rolls Royce ghost or yeah. phantom or whatever i mean it's it's a it's, super robust it's beefy i mean that's the same transmission that's in the gladiator that's the same transmission it's that's perfect a, that's in a lot of stuff yeah it's hellcat the per- perfect fit i think yeah very cool and then the the other thing that was surprising to me um was greg clark who is the the senior vp for North America for Ineos. I had a chance to interview him. And if you keep listening to the podcast, you'll hear my interview with Greg here in a few minutes. But one of the things that he brought up several times is that they built this customer, this, this truck for customer number one. And customer number one is 
James Radcliffe. Yeah. And he dropped this in, little piece of insight a few times. He says, we, we had to build it for it to survive Jim. And, and he, meant, he mentioned it a few times, which makes me think that either Jim is just really, really hard on vehicle. Like he's very yeah. aggressive as a driver, which is possible. Um, I'm, I have no doubt he's competent, but he may be on the aggressive side of the scale. Or he's planning on taking this thing really, really remote and very challenging locations. Yeah. And with it being built with the expectations of the owner, I mean, like, like does Jerry McGovern like care if the defender is capable or not? I don't know, but I doubt, I doubt that that's a high priority for him. Yeah. Whereas James Radcliffe is like, this thing has to survive my next expedition to Madagascar. Huh. So, okay. I mean, that's cool. I think that's I'm all pretty for cool. That. Let's yeah, take one to Madagascar. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I'll too. go anywhere right now. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I know. Anywhere we can go away, escape. Yeah, Where'd totally. Go? Yeah, totally. Well, what do you think of it? I mean, what's your what are your like initial thoughts and impressions on the vehicle? It looks interesting. Um, you know, I think it is a romantic vehicle more so than anything for me. Mm. Um, you know, I I see as a uh, the market for this from a business perspective has to be the NGOs. Um, it has to be maybe militaries, smaller militaries around the world to think that it's going to be successful here. I don't know. I mean, yeah. in, in what world am I not just going to drive a pickup truck? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I've come to learn that. I, yeah. learned, I learned that very late. If this would have come out and this is just my personal opinion, if this would have been here, five, 10 years ago, it would have had a lot of potential. Um, but now like we live in the golden age of, of the four wheel drive of the Overland vehicle, um, whatever you want to, you know, deem it. So it's harder for me to get excited about, about these new things because what we have here is so great. We have the Bronco coming out 392 Wrangler, if you want it, or a diesel Wrangler or a V6 Wrangler or a hybrid Wrangler or a small turbo diesel Wrangler or a small turbo Wrangler or, or an electric, electric Wrangler. Wrangler. Yeah. Amazing. You know, and the quality of those vehicles has gone up and so is the practicality. Um, you've seen the pickup trucks over here change. Um, Everything's getting yeah. way more capable. So I think it's cool. I just don't think that we'll really ever see a lot of them here. Like, I, I don't think there's any partic one particular reason as to why I would rush out to buy one other mm. than just wanting one because I think that they're really cool. And if they do actually come here, yeah, yeah, probably because I, like I like the concept of it's James Radcliffe's truck. Yeah. It had to go through his thing. Um, and I think the thing that kills most cars is the design by committee. Yeah. So it's kind of cool like to see that. Um, I hope it actually comes here, I guess, is the thing. I, I don't want to file, file it with the Bollinger, with the Cybertruck, with the yeah. Rivian, with the Lordstown Motors, with the, yeah. what was the one in Phoenix? Nikola? Yeah, Nikola's another one, yeah. All of there them. are so many of these new companies that are popping up, and they, they have to get the hype up, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we were just talking about this as like the new... Ford Lightning or the electric F-150, as yes, I'm going to call yeah, it, right? Sure. Um, it's not that Ford wasn't working on that. It's that unlike Rivian or Lordstown Motors or, or whoever these tech startups are, Ford doesn't really have to like raise capital. They don't have to raise interest. They have plants and they have engineers. They have plants and they, and yeah. they have engineers. Yeah. So um, it's, it's cool to see that Magna Stare is behind this because I think they bring a lot of manufacturing experience. Specifically, Magnus Air is an Austrian company for you, for those who do not know. They make everything. They specialize in making limited production cars for OEMs. They're best known for the Mercedes G-Wagon. Um, the Toyota Supra is made there. Jaguar I-Pace is made there. Like the Range Rover Evoque was made there for a few years, I think, with the convertible. So if they have kind of like these outlier vehicles magnus stare that is their business so to have them on as an engineering partner mm -hmm. that's great um i think it's ambitious that they're going to make their own you know build their own automotive facility but there's been a lot of advancements with you know automation and things these days so yeah and and they have actual money behind it right 
you know, if this was like some guy with an idea that was trying to raise money, I would be like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. But the fact he seems that fairly James committed. Ratcliffe is behind this, yeah, yeah, it's it's probably going to happen, and and I wish him the best. Like, like I I want to see these things running around. I mean, I, I think that these things would do fantastic in Australia. I think that they do fantastic in Africa. I think you know a lot of the uh, you know emerging world where a lot of the cars that I just mentioned for our use in the U.S. They still are a little bit too complicated for, for some places. Sure. Um, and then they're working on a hydrogen one, which That's I think right. is cool. Very interesting. Um, As opposed to electric, they're going to go, which they have hydrogen divisions within Ineos. So yeah. it is something that's very much within their wheelhouse and expertise. Yeah. Maybe so, that's what they're putting into Lewis Hamilton's engine. <laughs> they're a big sponsor of, of, of the Mercedes yeah. F1 team. I have a slightly different view on this vehicle. If they can make it desirable yeah. if they can make it like a g-wagon where maybe they partner with like aston martin or maybe they partner with bentley and you go at, at the bentley dealership is all of these beautiful bentley cars yeah and at the same dealership is the test track the really technical and it and it just appeals to this person the same person who still buys a rolex or an omega yeah. they are a fly fishermen they they like these things that are that feel or look analog even if yeah. they're not and that they they signal about who they are and if they can nail that if they can get the marketing right and they can get the messaging right which means don't try to make it popular have explorers drive around the world and use this thing and make it desirable not yeah. popular desirable and if they can pull that off where they, it is something that this guy gets it and his buddy wants to get one that's a little nicer. And then his buddy wants, if you can build that into this desirability, this signaling that I'm an adventurer, I drive a Grenadier, then they're going to do fine. They're going to crush it. But yeah. if that doesn't happen, it's going to be tough. I, I still think their biggest market is going to be the NGOs. Yeah. There's just so many luxury SUVs on the market these days, you know, uh, but that's like my opinion, man. <laughs> yeah, well, and the thing is, is we really don't know. Yeah. The one thing that we do know that's very, that's very positive is exactly what you said. This is a well-funded endeavor. It is being launched by a company that has a lot of success, an owner that is fully committed to seeing that this doesn't thing have to life. answer. Like yeah. the, the board may be his cat and his dog. It's a <laughs> yeah. privately owned company. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You know, um, he just decides this is what I want to do today. And, does and it. it's, and yeah, and he does it and he's passionate about it. And you can see that he loves it. He loves the whole concept. It, it so. looks great. Um, yeah. it, it looks like, I, I know Land Rover said they couldn't, uh, um, amongst many reasons, they couldn't build a Defender because of crash test ratings and pedestrian yeah. safety. And geez, there's this. And the, it's the amazing. Bronco. And then there's the <laughs> it's amazing. Grenadier. And, um. Yeah, thanks, Matt, for all of those thoughts on the NAOS. I think that it is such an exciting new vehicle and for this next portion of the podcast, we're going to actually shift back to my time in Virginia with the vehicle, and we're going to look at an interview that I did with Greg Clark, who is the VP of North America for the Ineos Automotive Group. So this is going to be an exciting little discussion with him where we'll learn a little bit more about the philosophy of the company and what we should expect coming next. I am out here with Greg Clark, who is managing the operations here in the United States for the import of the Enios Grenadier, which is an extremely exciting model for us that choose to travel backcountry by vehicle. The whole idea of overlanding is to explore the world, and there is no doubt in my mind that this vehicle has been designed for just that purpose. Greg, thank you so much for bringing this prototype 001 to us here in the United States. It's a pleasure. Thank you for coming, and uh, yeah, thanks for your enthusiasm about it so far. Yes, I mean we we are genuinely enthusiastic about this vehicle because it it looks like a homologation of all of the greats that have come before this day, mm -hmm. and the things that really worked with certain models and then have since sunset uh, with the modern age. So it's just really exciting to see body on frame, solid axles. 
three locking differentials, coil sprung suspension, a high quality reliable drivetrain. One of the questions that I had is Sir Radcliffe, he he definitely has a lot of passion <laughs> yes. behind this Very much. behind this project. Absolutely. Can you speak a little bit about him as a traveler and his passion for backcountry and overland travel. I think that might set the stage for those listening. I, I think it's it's quite well publicized what our, our sponsor and founder and actually hey you know, our, our number one customer. You know that <laughs> let's be clear here that you know, this is a vehicle that is designed to be used and not in theory but in practice and that's something that, that the Sejim is definitely going to do. I think it's relatively well publicized whether it be Antarctic trips or whether it be trips around Africa about exactly what it is that Sir Jim enjoys doing in his in his spare time. One thing I would like to mention is is his absolute determination and focus on high performance, innovation, and just just performing at a very very high level. And whether that goes into the the, the, the companies that he he owns and runs, or whether the uh, the partnerships or the teams that he becomes involved with, Mercedes Formula One, for example, the the, the, the Grenadiers cycling team, the America's Cup racing. And depending on where you are on the globe, those are either interesting or they're marginally interesting. But it, 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 it kind of imparts this, this common thread of determination and insistence upon performance. And performance in this particular case with the Grenadier is about capability. Mm. And this is something that the Sir Jim is going to use personally and will use in anger and will use absolutely to its, to its full intent. And so therefore, as customer number one, we've got to deliver on that. Mm. So that is, that's kind of an overriding theme that, that I found in my short time with INEOS has, has flown throughout the company. And it's something that I'm absolutely subscribed to. And we've got to make sure that it absolutely works here in North America with, uh, with the Grenadier. Yeah, what a rare opportunity to take someone with that <laughs> degree of passion. And not only that, but personal capability to make a dream come true. When I think about bringing this vehicle to the United States, obviously many of the questions come up that we've seen around the diesel drivetrain, but uh, the diesel drivetrain is becoming less and less critical. The reality is is that ultra-low sulfur diesel is not available in many of the remote places of the world. Yes. However, you certainly can find petrol to put into a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And so I have actually even personally found that to be much less of a criti critical concern. But what would be of importance and concern would be how do you service a vehicle like this? If yeah. you if you were if you were going to take it across Africa, what are your guys' thoughts around building out either a dealer infrastructure, which of course will be slow, understandably, mm -hmm. but how do you provide remote service while that's being built out? Yeah, and I think that's that's a question that definitely my, my colleagues are responsible for Africa. Australia, New Zealand is another critical market there where you can get hundreds and hundreds of miles away from civilization. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the case here in most parts of the US, but still a consideration. Mm -hmm. So in terms of servicing, um, well, let me start by saying, selling the vehicle, and I mentioned earlier on, we're going to establish a network of, of dealerships and effectively working with, to, with partners that share our same values, that understand this product and understand the customer. Selling it is, is almost the easy part. Mm. You can take somebody's money and you can actually deliver the vehicle. It's actually maintaining, supporting, and nurturing that ownership experience over the course of time. Mm. So whether you're in North America, whether you're in Sub-Saharan Africa, whether you're in Australia, we're looking first and foremost for the right partners to work with in terms of the sales and service process. And then definitely, you know that there are people who are either gonna use the vehicle or live with the vehicle some distance away from where they've purchased mm. it. So providing an after sales network that is dedicated to, to service or having flying doctors, flying spanners, however sure. you call sure. them, you know, that's definitely something which is in the plans and, and, and something absolutely, it might be even our founder who is in Botswana sure. or Namibia or somewhere and the car is designed to be used and so therefore stuff is eventually going to break because we all make mistakes out there sure. and stuff breaks. It's just what happens and how do we respond to that when a customer does break something. And we've actually seen that as a great solution from other manufacturers, particularly bespoke camper manufacturers. Mm. They, their solution to that problem is you just you fly in the parts and the help that you need. Uh, because as this is being built out, that will take time, totally understandable. Mm. And looking at the vehicle with it 
right next to me, I can see how robust it is intended to be. So it will be just those occasional accidents if you have a, an accident on the road or if you have a mechanical issue uh, due to some unforeseen circumstance. And then you just find a nice little lodge and wait until help arrives. So, But may I say one other thing? It's, it's Yeah, absolutely. We, we have to have the support network and the infrastructure that that inspires confidence in, in the owner when they want to go off and into the the, the, you know, the deepest of backwoods or off into the desert. Um, from the get-go though, we've got to make this, this vehicle the right balance of, of technology and simplicity. Sure. Durability, capability, reliability, they're kind of the three main tenets for us. We recognize that to, to survive, to be relevant and to be comfortable in this 21st century, there mm. are a certain amount of technology that has to go in there. Mm. But it's keeping that to, to just the bare minimum everything you need and nothing you don't and also cutting down the number of ecus the things that electronically could potentially go wrong which definitely are not that easy to service when you're out there in in the field and that really is is critical for us and um, is clearly a challenge as we manage that balance between technology and simplicity but we'll have significantly less ecus in the vehicle than uh, than many of the other competitive manufacturers Greg, you're literally speaking the war cry of so many of us that choose to travel the world, having that emphasis on simplicity with also the acknowledgement that there are regulations, that there are safety requirements that are you cannot get around them as a manufacturer. And for good you, reason. Yeah, and absolutely for good reason. So the fact that that is top of mind for you and your team is, it not only makes this vehicle more endearing, but it speaks to the true intention of it as you bring it to market. Uh, we know that we're still a couple years away, but just know that there a lot of us are rooting for you and this vehicle to be successful in North America. And I'm actually standing here on this mountaintop overlooking beautiful Virginia. And in fact, there's a, a mountaintop not too far away that was owned by my seventh great uncle, George Washington. Is that right? Yes, that is. So wow. pl a pleasure to speak to you today, Greg. <laughs> Scott, thank you for thank coming. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Indeed. Appreciate it. Pleasure.